everybody, Dr. Ryan here. I hope you and your family are well. I'm super excited to be presenting a systematic approach to X-ray interpretation. Let's get going. So a big thank you to manualofmedicine.com for this handy summary. So first up, guys, when approaching an X-ray, we have to ascertain whether the technical quality of the X-ray is up to scratch. All right, to this end, we speak to a couple of points. So first up, Make sure it's the right patient and know the date of when this x-ray was taken. Then you want to ascertain the imaging technique. Is this a PA film or an AP film? So is it a posterior anterior, which is by convention how we do normal x-rays, or is it anterior posterior, which speaks to the, the x-ray being done at uh, via bedside unit. So in a PA film, the clavicles are usually more V-shaped, but in the AP film, the clavicles are usually more horizontal. And only assess the heart size on a PA view because an AP projection artificially magnifies the heart. So it may seem like the cardiothoracic ratio is larger than normal when actually that is not the case on an AP view. Then we need to assess whether the X-ray is rotated. To do this, you look at the medial ends of the clavicles and those should be equidistant from the spinous processes. If not, you can be sure that there is rotation. Is the X-ray adequately inspired? So you want to count the number of ribs. Normally, there should be at least 8 to 10 posterior ribs per hemithorax. All right. Is there adequate exposure? And to this end, you need to look just beyond the cardiac silhouette. And you should see some detail of the intervertebral discs. And if you can't see that, it's probably underexposed. All right. Okay, now in assessing the actual characteristics of the film, there's many ways to do it. You can go from inside out or from outside in, but the key thing is that you gotta be systematic so you don't miss things. So in the frontal plane, look at the symmetry, right? Are finding similar on both the left and right sides. You can look at the bones while counting the ribs and look for fractures, lesions, which speaks to lucencies or densities in the bone, or rib notching, which are small grooves along the edges of the ribs, which suggests a coarctation of the aorta. In terms of the plural, um, Structures, you want to assess for any plural lines which suggest pneumothorax, masses, thickening, or calcification. Now, the money is often in the lung fields. You want to assess the degree of whiteness, which speaks to opacification, equivalency between the right and left sides, opacifications and infiltrates, and we often speak of reticular or nodular infiltrates. Reticular are basically straight, kind of wispy infiltrates versus nodular, which are more rounded uh, opacities. The presence of curly A or B lines, usually in the setting of fluid overload or heart failure. The lung apices above the clavicles and the vasculature. Regarding vasculature, we want to know the size, the position, and whether vascular markings run to the lung periphery or not. Now, if indeed you do see infiltrates, everybody, you want to note the pattern. Are they lobar, cloud-like densities with air bronchograms, which usually suggest pneumonia, right? Or are they net-like and reticular, which suggests institutional lung disease? Uh, upper lobe predominance speaks to inhalation, lung injury. Lower low predominance suggests aspiration, asbestosis, sarcoidosis. All right, and in terms of the trachea, um, you want to find that air column and check for tracheal deviation. Uh, if there is tracheal deviation, often the case is tension pneumothorax or pleural diffusion. If the patient's intubated, the endotracheal tube tip should ideally be four centimeters above the carina. Then the hilum, as we know, contains the pulmonary arteries and veins, the main stem bronchi, and the lymph nodes. And if the hilum is enlarged, that if the hyla uh, contour is straight or convex instead of concave, you can be sure there's some degree of hyla enlargement. All right. Um, Ninety-five percent of the time, if you have unilateral hyla enlargement, there probably is an underlying malignancy. And looking at the heart, look at the normal cardiothoracic ratio, which is normally less than zero point five of the entire uh, in dimension of the thorax. Right. If it's more than 0.5, then you can be sure there's, there's, there's some degree of cardiomegaly on a PA firm. Note the shape and location within the mediastinum. And look at the, the cardiac shadows right and left. So the right cardiac shadow, this is basically the right atrium. And the left cardiac shadow, top to bottom, is first up the aortic arch, then the left pulmonary artery, and then the left ventricle. All right. You want to assess the contour, the shape, the size, and location. Uh, white blurring of any cardiac body suggests airspace disease of the upper or middle lung lobes. Look at your cardiophrenic angle. If it's blunted, that speaks to a tumor mass like lymphoma or other mediastinal tumors. P 
pericardial fat, pericardial cysts, cardiophrenic space viruses, and diaphragmatic hernia. In terms of your hemidiaphragms, you know that if there's flattening of the hemidiaphragms, that's usually in the context of uh, COPD or asthma exacerbation or foreign body or some degree of obstructive lung disease. If there's air under the right hemidiaphragm that speaks to a perforated viscous, but air under the left hemidiaphragm is normal because that's the cardiac, uh, rather the gastric bubble. Okay, if there's blurring of the edge of the diaphragm, that speaks to low lobe airspace disease. I look at the height of the hemidiaphragm, normally right is more than left because of the underlying liver. And if one side is, abnormal, uh, is abnormally higher, that speaks to volume loss in the way of atelectasis. Okay, looking at the lateral x-ray, all right, you want to ascertain the retrosternal uh, cardiac space. It should be clear. If it's not clear, you're thinking about thymoma, terrible lymphoma, teratoma, and thyroid tumor, the infamous T's. In terms of the mediastinum, you want to note the posterior paratracheal uh, tissue line between the anterior trachea and the posterior esophagus. Uh, if it's less than 3 millimeters, you can rule out lymphadenopathy. Looking at the hilum, you want to look for changes like enlargement, shifts, and asymmetries of pulmonary vessels, mainstem bronchi and lymph nodes, and extra pacification around the pulmonary vessels and bronchi, which speaks to higher lymphadenopathy. In terms of the actual spinal column, you want to assess the vertebral bodies for density and abnormal shape or compressions. Assess that intervertebral disc space, if not well defined, may indicate discitis. Assess your neural foramina, which are holes essentially between the, the vertebral processes. If enlarged, it's likely a tumor or a cyst sitting in there. If narrowed, it's likely bony enlargement impinging on the spinal nerves. There should be a clear space posterior to the heart, everybody. If it's a pacifier, they could speak to consolidation, atelectasis, enlarged vessels, masses, or hiatus hernias. The diaphragm, as we know, as indicated here, is flat if the height above the AP costophrenic angle line is less than 2.7 centimeters. A flattened hemodiaphragm, like we said, speaks to hyperinflation. Then look at your costophrenic angle. Small pleural diffusions are best picked up with a lateral projection, most commonly due to congestive heart failure. Alrighty, so guys, we're going to just talk about some buzzwords regarding uh, chest X-ray imaging. So any white area, any white area, as depicted here, let's just get uh, a pen in there. Any white area here speaks to an opacification. And if it's dense and homogeneous, that's most likely is a consolidation or could be a mass. But if you have air bronchograms, like we have a beautiful air bronchogram here, which is kind of black area going through the consolidation, that speaks to a lobal pneumonia. If you have uh, hyperlucent lung fields with flattened uh, hemidiaphragms like here, that speaks to some degree of obstructive airway disease, usually in the setting of COPD or asthma. This is a classic picture for heart failure. All right, when the heart is more than 50% of the AP diameter, like we said, cephalization speaking to upper zone diversion of those pulmonary vessels, curly B lines, which speaks to interstitial edema, right, or, or lymphatic. Um, congestion. This is classic setting of left ventricular failure. All right, uh, here is a cavity, a cavity containing an airflow level, and that's a lung abscess, everybody. So often these patients will have um, clubbing and halitosis and all the rest that comes with suppurative lung diseases. Here we have upper lobe cavitation and consolidation with or without hyaluronopathy. This is the classic picture of pulmonary TB. All righty, so I suggest that if you want to assess yourself on these x-rays, you uh, pause the video when we introduce a new film and give yourself a chance to interpret what you see. Alrighty, and it's always good guys to be systematic and to go through the different characteristics of chest x-ray assessment when approaching each individual film. But for the sake of time, I think we're just going to head into where the money is on each of these x-rays. Alrighty, are you ready? Are you steady? Fasten your seatbelt, man. Here we go. So what we see here is a dense homogeneous opacity, a dense homogeneous opacity in the left lower zone with a curvy, sorry, with a curvy linear upper border. Alrighty. Look at this. Curvy linear upper border. It's called a meniscus sign. We can't really see that left costophrenic angle. Right, so there's obliteration of the left costophrenic angle, the trachea and the heart and the mediastinum are shifted to the right, as we can see here, the trachea is sitting more on the right hand side. So this, my friends, is the left side of pleural effusion. All right, and four common causes in our current clinical setting here in Sub-Saharan Africa, you must think about pulmonary TB, uh, paranormonic, 
um, effusion, bronchial carcinoma, and pulmonary infarct. So we're going to tap that pleural uh, fluid and send it off uh, for a variety of tests that we use criteria called LICE criteria to ascertain whether it's an exudate or a transudate. So exudative pleural effusions means that you simply compare the protein in the fluid to the protein in the serum. And if that ratio is above 0 0.5, it's most likely an exudate. Right. And you're also going to look at the LDH. And if the LDH in the pleural fluid compared to the serum is above 0 0.6, that's also an exudate. And if the LDH in the pleural fluid is above two-thirds of the upper limit of normal of the serum LDH, that's an exudate. So common causes of exudate in our setting, you must think about infection. So it could be paranormonic, it could be TB. You must think of um, a malignant process. It could also be autoimmune. Pulmonary infarct uh, can go either way. Right? But classic causes of transudated pleural effusion include any cause of hypoalbuminemia, so cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, protein losing, enteropathy, right? even hypothyroidism, and classically, heart failure. Alrighty, here we are. What do you see? What do you see? Alright, so here we can classically see it's a PA projection showing a dense homogeneous pacification Right, there we are with a curvilinear border bilaterally, and we can't really see those costophrenic angles. Hey, costophrenic angles, where you at? <laughs> this is a bilateral pleural effusion, everybody. And causes for bilateral pleural effusion include cirrhosis of the liver, nephrotic syndrome, both of which are going to cause some degree of hypoalbuminemia, congestive heart failure, bilateral extensive TB, and collagen disease. And there we have systemic lupus, erythematosus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Alrighty. So what do you see here? What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? So here we can see uh, X-ray PA view showing opacity here with an irregular, irregular margin occupying the right upper and part of the middle zone. So this most likely is a bronchial cancer, but essentially you can, you can even describe it as a dense homogenous pacification. It could be a consolidation. It could be a bronchial cancer. And as we see two differentials being TB and consolidation. Three investigations here to confirm a diagnosis. So you want to take sputum to send off for cytology to determine if any malignant cells. You want to do a CT of the chest with a view to autosome guided uh, uh, finding laceration cytology. So that will be done by our colleagues in cardiothoracics ideally. They will also probably want to do a bronch and biopsy the lesion. And if there's any palpable peripheral lymph nodes, it's a good idea to biopsy or to do a FNAC and then a biopsy, all right? Okay, what do we see here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so there's an opacity here, right? In the left upper and part of the left middle zone. Right, with an irregular margin. Irregular margin. We also note that the what's happening in the diaphragm, guys? Normally we said that the right hemidiaphragm is higher than the left because of the underlying liver. But hello, here the left hemidiaphragm is higher than the right. That speaks to something wrong going wrong, probably with the phrenic nerve. So putting these two together, it's probably a bronchial carcinoma with a left phrenic nerve palsy. Okay, what's happening here? So here. Uh, we can see uh, it's a PA film once more showing a homogeneous rounded nodular shadow with clear margins in the left middle zone. And five causes of this can be consolidation and tuberculoma, which are infective causes. Could be a secondary deposit of bronchial carcinoma or bronchial adenoma, which are metastatic causes. It could be a lung abscess before birth or even a hydatid cyst. Other somewhat less common causes of this X-ray is an insisted pleural diffusion, a hamatoma. A rheumatoid nodule, granulomatosis, polyangiitis, right, um, which is previously previously known as Wegener's granulomatosis, aspergilloma, neurofibroma, fungal infection, or granuloma. How are you going to investigate the patient further? It likes to do a lateral view of the X-ray to see exactly, better define this mass and determine in which mediastinum it lies. We're going to do a full blood count and an ESR, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is essentially uh, would indicate infection. Sputum for microscopy, culture, and sensitivity for gene expert and cytology. You can do a Mantua test, you can do a CT test and a, guide, a guided fine needle aspiration cytology, and of course, a bronch and bronchial brushings for AFB and malignant cells. All right, this is a busy one. So, what's happening here, everybody? Well, we can see a PA X-ray film showing multiple nodular shadows, okay, of variable size, variable shape, having cannonball appearance. So this is multiple secondaries in the lung. All right, five sources. So we know a lot of uh, malignancies like to metastasize the lung, namely carcinoma of the stomach, prostate, breast, teratoma, renal cell cancer, carcinoma of the thyroid gland. All right. 
uh, this, what's happening here, everybody? Well, um, yeah, we have multiple nodular shadows of variable size and shape, all having cannonball appearance with the right dome of the diaphragm being elevated. And of course, this speaks to multiple secondary deposits in the lung with the right phrenic nerve pulse. So you can see that right hemidiaphragm is somewhat elevated there. Okay, what's happening here? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. We like this one here. It's a PA form much more showing a dense homogeneous opacity involving the right upper and part of the middle zone with an air bronchogram. There's our beloved air bronchogram in there. And differential for this is consolidation, bronchial carcinoma, and TB. But in terms of consolidation, if you're going the consolidation route, you're aiming to diagnose a lobe pneumonia. Remember, use your CURB 65 index to grade the severity. Ideally, you'd like to investigate with a full blood count and the ESR sputum for microscopy cost sensitivity, gene expert, and acid bacilli, and sputum cytology. What are two complications of this? Uh, yeah, of course, the lobe pneumonia can complicate with the lung abscess and the empyema. So watch out what's happening in this film. Oh, this looks nice and nice and very nice and nice, yes. So this is the X-ray PA view showing a cavity in here. Mm, not a dental cavity now. <laughs> a chest cavity with an air fluid level in the right middle and um, lower zones. This speaks to a right-sided lung abscess, everybody. How will you confirm the diagnosis? Once again, a full blood count with ESR should be high. You do a CT of the chest and take a sputum for a microscopy cautious sensitivity, gene expert, and AFBs. Three important complications of a lung abscess are empyema, thoracic, bronchiectasis, and if that seeds into circulation, can cause a cerebral abscess. The commonest cause is aspiration of infected material. Often happens in the setting of people who are inebriated from alcohol. It happens in people who have strokes and can't swallow and they aspirate. Uh, people who are post ictal and they can't maintain their airway. So what's demonstrated here? What do you see? Aha, uh -huh. let's have a look. So it's a PA film showing a patchy opacification, right? With some translucent shadows involving the right upper and part of the middle zone, right? You can also see it here as well, right? And this speaks to a right side of pulmonary tuberculosis, all right? How would you want to confirm your investigation? Once again, FPC with ESR, you dispute them, especially for gene but together with MCS and AFP, you can even do a tuberculin skin test. And this is the same uh, approach, basically, uh, with the XAP film showing patchy opacities in both upper and mid zones bilaterally. This speaks to bilateral extensive TB. Okay, what are the radiological findings here? This shows a beautiful, gorgeous, um, cavity so there's our cavity here boom shakalaka right in the left upper zone this speaks to pulmonary tb why is it so important what's the significance of a cavity that signifies that this is an active and a so-called open case of tb which is highly contagious you want to start that patient on tb treatment as soon as possible what do we see here well it's the xap from showing multiple millery mottling the so-called millet seeds right involving both lungs bilaterally. This is a picture of military TB, which speaks to dissemination of the TB into the bloodstream. But four common differentials for this picture are sarcoidosis, pulmonary eosinophilia, histoplasmosis, pneumoconiosis, also hemosiderosis, which happens in the setting of mitral stenosis. How you can investigate the patient, you can do a urine lipoeribomanin, which is called a urine lamb test, a full blood count with the ESR and a diff count, especially looking for eosinophilia, sputum AFBs and gene expert, mantle test, and a bronch with a bronchial lavage, a bowel. Okay, what's happening here, guys? So here, I think it's kind of obvious where the money is. It's X-ray of the chest showing multiple calcified shadows of variable size and shape involving all zones of both lung fields bilaterally. These are multiple calcifications, guys, in the lung parenchyma. Five causes can be TB, usually speaking to heal TB, commonly in the upper zone. And you know the TB loves the upper zones because ventilation is great here and perfusion not too good, which favors the deposition of the AFBs. Uh, differential, of course, can include adult chickenpox pneumonia, which has a wide distribution, usually small, one to three millimeters in size. Don't forget histoplasmosis, a hamatoma, which speaks to popcorn calcification, hypercalcemia due to any cause. And we know there's a big differential there. It could be granulomatous, it could be renal failure, immobility, malignancy, very important, familial, hypocalcemic, hypercalcemia, could be a variety of endocrine causes and drugs, alveolar microlithiasis and silicosis as well. This is the radiological findings here. So here, what we see 
is beautiful, beautiful, hyperinflated lungs, hyperlucid lung fields, right, with a low and flat hemidiaphragm bilaterally, the heart seems elongated and so-called tubular, the ribs are widely spaced, and this is a classic feature of emphysema. One further investigation you want to do is a lung function, so clinch the diagnosis of obstructive AV disease, where the force exposure volume in one second compared to the FVC in the ratio is going to be reduced below 0.7. Alrighty, and the severity is of course it's uh, uh, determined by the the FEV1. Alrighty, what's happening here? This is an example of a bulla. It's a bulla. It's a bulla. Look at this. It's a big translucent area on the right upper zone with no lung marking and blood vessels bound by a thin hairline shadow. It's a right-sided giant bulla, and the possibility is, is it could be an apical pneumothorax. These are other possibilities with a collapsed lung margin, uh, or it just could be a big old cavity. Three complications of Ebola, it can rupture, causing a pneumothorax, it can, cause, uh, it can be secondarily infected, and of course it can have a fungus support inside called an aspergilloma. Okay, what's happening here, guys? So here we can see some beautiful foreign bodies sitting in the chest cavity. Oh, dear. You can see a chest tube here, which is an intercostal chest drain, another chest tube here. The right uh, lung field is increasingly translucent. All right, um, and this is the right side of pneumothorax with subcutaneous emphysema. Look at the soft tissues. There's air in that soft tissue speaking to subcutaneous emphysema bilaterally. Uh, probably the most common cause is traumatic with penetrating injury to the thorax or post-MVA. You can also get it when you aspirate your pneumothorax, an acute severe asthma with alveolar rupture and intermittent positive airway pressure and barotrauma. Okay, what's happening here, everybody? This is a beautiful example of this kind of pathology, right? You see, actually, it's a PA view showing a hypertranslucent area right here, right? Without bronchovascular markings. Look, we can't really see those bronchovascular markings. Where you at, man? Where you at? I can't see you. With a collapsed lung margin on the right side. This, this here, this um, kind of white... A pacified area is the right-sided lung. So this is the right-sided pneumothorax, everybody. How are you going to, oh, well, what causes it? Uh, medical causes a rupture of a subpleural emphysematous bulla, rupture of a subpleural tuberculous focus, or rupture of a subpleural blip, especially in young adults. And how are you going to manage it? Well, if it's small and asymptomatic, complete rest and follow-up. If it's large, like in the example that we just depicted, you've got to insert an intercostal chest strain and address the underlying etiology. What's happening here? Surprise, surprise. Uh, this looks like a, 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 well, a pneumothorax like we've just seen, but beware. What is this? This is fluid. This is an air fluid level, okay? So there's a horizontal fluid level with obliteration of the right costophrenic and cardiophrenic angles. This, my friend, is our beloved right hydropneumothorax. Mentioned causes for this in our setting. It could be iatrogenic, especially during pleural fluid aspiration, which is a common cause. It could be a bronchopleural fistula. It could be traumatic in the way of penetrating injury or thoracic surgery. It could be due to rupture of lung abscess, esophageal rupture, erosion by bronchial carcinoma, and everybody's favorite TB, 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 and more TB. <coughs> All right, what's happening here, everybody? So this is a homogeneous opacification involving the whole left lung field. Some people call this a whiteout of the left lung. Uh, we note that the trachea and the heart are shifted to the left or righty, and there's hypertranslucency, so there's compensatory hyperinflation on the right lung. This speaks to collapse of the left lung, and two causes are bronchial carcinoma with complete bronchial obstruction or a foreign body in the left bronchus. Also, if the patient is intubated, it could just be a mucus plug sitting in the airway. You want to do a CT chest and bronchoscopy, all right? These, this is a gorgeous example of bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy, bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy. <laughs> And this speaks to it being, in our setting, either sarcoidosis, lymphoma, or TB. Remember, we use a scanning classification to classify the different radiological stages of sarcoidosis. Or what's happening here, everybody? This is a nice example of bilateral ring shadows. Look at these multiple ring shadows. Ring, 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 ring shadows. All right, involving the middle and lower zones of both lung fields, more so on the right, indeed. And this patient has clubbing. Speaks to bilateral bronchiectasis. And here's the same pathology, but mainly on on the right lower zone ring shadows that's right side of bronchiectasis what are the causes of bronchiectasis a handy mnemonic that i came across is called ok chaps it could be o which speaks to obstruction of the bronchus by a tumor or foreign body it could be cartagenous syndrome 
That which keeps company with other issues like sinus issues and the patients have infertility, cystic fibrosis as well, hypoglobulin, gamma globulinemia for the HAs, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, P speaks to pneumonia, P for pertussis, don't forget TB, TB, and more TB, and S is Sjogren's and other connective tissue issues. Okay, chaps, that causes bronchiectasis. I mean, what's happening here? This is so-called right, uh, right side of whiteout, all right? Homogeneous pacification involving the whole right hemithorax. Differentials, once we said, uh, just like the previous case, massive consolidation, massive pleural diffusion, complete collapse of the right lung. You can investigate with a CD chest, a bronchoscopy and biopsy, and aesthetic added fine needle aspiration cytology. What's happening here, everybody? We can see that we have uh, widening of the superior mediastinum. What that, man? And differentials can be lymphoma, sarcoidosis, bronchial carcinoma, retrosternal goiter. Okay, what's happening here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sure we can see this. Um, there is air under the right hemidiaphragm. Air under the right hemidiaphragm, which is not normal. It speaks to perforation of gas containing a hollow viscous. Common causes are perforation of a chronic duodenal ulcer, perforation of the ileum, either secondary to TV, typhoid, or Crohn's. You want to phone your surgeon, man. Drip and suck, so no pass, nasogastric tube insertion, and suction give the patient IV fluid to replenish any losses. Broad spectrum antibiotic, usually with flagell, which is metronidazole, and call your surgeons for surgical repair. What's happening here? Mm -hmm. This is most interesting, no? So gastric bubble sitting on the right. The heart is sitting on the right. Okay, so this is what we call um, sinus inversus. So here we can see the heart is looking to sit, looking to the right, but there's no gastric bubble there. So this is not sinus inversus. This is dextrocardia. What's happening here? Okay, so we've got an X-ray of the chest PA view, which is going to give us fullness of the pulmonary conus. Number one, number two, straightening of the left heart border. This is mitral stenosis. For other findings, maybe widening of the crina with horizontal left main bronchus because of that large left atrium, double uh, contour of the right heart border because that left atrium is just so big, upper zone diversion, curly B lines, even get pulmonary hemosiderosis. What's happening here? This is a boot shaped heart. Looks like a boot shaped heart. Oh dear. Boot shaped configuration, which speaks to right ventricular enlargement, right? And oligemic lung fields. You put it all together, this could indicate tetralogy of fallow. And we've covered this in the previous video. This is a fun comic from George Munis and Company at midcomic.com. Thank you so much. So, yee haw, boot shaped heart. And the four characteristic things in the VSD is pulmonic stenosis with the right side of ventricular hypertrophy, a ventricular septal defect, and an overriding aorta, which will cause the cyanosis. All right. So, here we see a large globular heart. Nice and big, nice and big. Lung fields are oligemic as well, note that. So this is probably a pericardial diffusion. Five common causes in our setting, guys. TB, pericarditis. Lymphoma, following any other acute pericarditis, sometimes violently mediated, could be a malignancy, collagen diseases, and mixed edema. All right, what's happening here? This is a classic picture of uh, left ventricular failure, all right? So we see an uh, increased cardiothoracic ratio here. We see these bat wings or alveolar edema. Sometimes you can have pleural diffusion, sometimes curly B lines. All right, so this is pulmonary edema. How you manage it? Prop the patient up. Oxygen if the patient's hypoxic. IV diuresis with Lasix. IV morphine if the patient's very distressed but blood pressure permitting. Right, you can use an ACE inhibitor, you can use vasodilator, and address the primary etiology. Okay, moving on to X ray of the spine, guys. Mm -hmm, this is beautiful. Absolutely lovely. So we see calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament, boom, and interspinous ligaments and syndesmophyte formation with bridging, giving rise to the bamboo spine appearance. And this speaks to ankylosing spondylitis. What's happening here? Okay, this is not too uncommon, right? The X-ray of the dorsal lumbar spine AP view showing reduction of the joint space between T7, T8, and also T8 with partial destruction of the vertebral body as a pair of vertebral shadow that can appreciate in both sides with marginal sclerosis. This, my friend, is POTS disease, which is TB of the spine and tubercular spondylitis. It is a combination of arthritis and osteomyelitis induced by TB. This is X-ray of the skull. Right, which is essentially showing multiple punched out lytic lesions, boom, boom, and boom. 
of variable size and shape all over the skull, probably in the setting of multiple myeloma, how you can investigate. Do you have full blood count with ASR? Ideally, do you have plasma protein electrophoresis, serum immunophoresis, urine from Bruins Jones protein, you want to order a serum free light change and that, and bone marrow examination, atypical plasma cells. Watch out for your peripheral features uh, or complications, being hypercalcemia, renal impairment, anemia. All right, together with bony lytic lesions, hyperviscosity, amyloidosis, all righty, and bacterial infections because of immunopoiesis. What's happening here, everybody? So we have a, a X-ray of the feet, all right? And what we can really appreciate here is two bony outgrowths that we can see, right? Um, one, two, involving the first metatarsophalangeal joint, and one small one in the second DIP joint, all right? Together with destruction of the first interphalangeal joint, you can see an um, overhanging edge there, so this speaks to chronic trabeous gout. What's happening here? This is beautiful picture of the hands, the X-ray of the hands, showing introduction of all the joint spaces. Periarticular osteopenia, that we can see here, those uh, um, areas flanking the joints, involving the metacarpal phalangeals and wrist joints of both hands. This disorganization of all the PIP joints on both hands, alrighty. Right, this is edge-shaped deformity of the thumb, bilaterally, an ulnar deviation of both hands. There we are, and this, my friend, is a rheumatoid arthritis. God bless you, and I hope this was helpful for you. Just some encouragement. The book of James chapter 1, verse 5 says, Should you require wisdom, ask of the Lord, who gives graciously to all, it shall be given you. That's my prayer for you, beloved, that you may increase in wisdom. I hope this video has helped. God bless you.